So welcome to yet another edition of Remembering When. I'm joined in this segment by Mike Watson, uh, four-time Bermuda Day Half Marathon champion, uh, an Olympian. Uh, we're going to go through all of that, Mike. Um, what got you into running? Uh, well, all of us are thrown into the races in primary school. And uh, we had a, a, um, a PE teacher that, that, you know, he, he definitely, um, you know, he definitely enforced discipline. He didn't take no mess. Uh, he was from Scotland, Mr. Jimmy Copeland. Of course, a lot of St. Georgians knew him from his involvement in football, mm -hmm. uh, particularly at the, uh, uh, the, the St. George's Colts. And I think he did some work with Wellington Rovers um, back then as well. Yeah. But he was one of the guys that, you know, in the um, cross country runs during school that realized I was, uh, was um, you know, um, much faster than everybody else. Of course, he threw me in into school sports and I got my tail cut that first year. I think I came eighth. And the next year, I um, was third. Uh, I didn't embarrass myself too badly. And uh, and then I won. I won from there on in. Except in high school, I think it was one year. Maybe in my second year, first year or second year in high school, I didn't didn't um, um get involved. But after that, um, I kind of continued to um dominate um, to some degree, but but a guy named Glenn Basson, he gave me a, a few licks, I think, um, at some point. He ran for Robert Crawford, and I was teasing him the other day, but he, um, um, he was the man back then, but then he, 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 was, he was telling my son and I that I discouraged him <laughs> from running after that, so, um, but, but he, I thought he was pretty good, too, yeah. So. When, 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 you realize, when you realize you have a little bit of talent, um, what drove you even further uh, to, to want to pursue uh, running at probably the highest level? Well, I had a love for horses. Um, of course, everybody knows that. Um, and I always um, juggled between running and horses. So um, technically speaking, I probably wouldn't be the best candidate for um, training for running because half of my time was spent with horses. But um, eventually, um, Clive Long recruited me um, from, um, and I'm going to give credit to the late Philip Gishard, mm -hmm. uh, Jimmy Copeland, and um, um, trying to think who else was, was. But anyway, we they took me up to the, my PE teacher then in, in high school took me up to Mike Woods, uh, took me up to um, the cross country runs that the BTFA, um, which Bina was known as then, um, had. And uh, I used to come second and third behind Gary Wilkson and I believe Peter Lever. And so obviously I was much younger than this guy. So Clive Long was quick to recruit me. And I got involved more of the serious training after that. Um, up to that point, I didn't realize you trained so much for running. I just used to run, you know, go to the races, so to speak. Uh, the PE teachers used to make me um, do runs uh, cross country, but I, I thought it was just a PE formality, so to speak. <laughs> until I got involved, yeah, until I got involved in the track and got a real awakening and realized, hey man, we we run over and over and over, lift weights and you know, do speed work and and you know, and the like. So um even jumping training at times, um drills, so to speak. So I really got serious then, but um when I got involved, um I guess because I was a distance runner, I appeared to be much more disciplined and serious than a lot of the other um, athletes that were training at the stadium. Um, 
so so I guess um, you know they talked to me and I I got pretty um, serious and was able to make the Karifta team and of course went to Karifta and got a real awakening because I, I didn't do too well in my first Karifta in Jamaica uh, at least not to me I mean my I I was I think fifth or sixth in the final in the fifteen hundred. And then seventh or eighth in the three thousand. Uh, but the funny thing is, after that, I um, originally was deemed more of a longer distance runner. You know, so Clive Long focused more on three thousand, five thousand meters for me, probably because I used to do good in cross country. Um, but no one saw me as a, a shorter track runner, you know, an 800 runner or, or 400 runner, you know, um, they saw me more as a distance runner. But the funny thing is we traveled to Quantico Relays in um, Virginia um, shortly after, shortly after that first Carifta and Clive Long had me entered in the 5,000 and he thought that I was kind of getting an easy break compared to everybody else because they was running more than one race. I don't know why he looked at it like that because 5,000 meters is so long. You know, you only need to run it once uh, in comparison to running maybe a few back-to-back -back sprints. But either way, he threw me in the 800. He said, no, no, Watson, you're going to run the 800 because we want to give you more to do. And of course, I didn't do any different. I, I just did whatever. I was focused and disciplined enough, but I didn't know too much about 800 meter running other than an inter-school competition. Um, um, and I ran the 800, kind of as a trial, and I ran 156, I think, which broke the Bermuda racket. And I was like, oh, okay, well, this is, I still got to run the final, so <laughs> maybe I got to step it up a little bit more if that's the Bermuda racket and I end up running 154 and coming second in the final. So um, that became the Bermuda racket um, at that time. I think Carlson Phillips, um, well, I broke Jay Kemp's Bermuda racket uh, when I ran the 156 and the 154. But then I think Carlson Phillips, um, Ira, one of Ira Phillips, the great Ira Phillips' son, he was in Canada and of course he's, he's older than me in, in college and he um, he ran a Bermuda record, I think 152 something, uh, 153 something like that in change and, um, and broke my Bermuda racket. Um, but in time, uh, I think in my next Garifto, so I broke that racket. And then finally I got to meet Carlson. He came back home and competed in the um, the events at home. And he never beat me um, in any races. But he, he was a quick guy. He was a little faster than me at 400 meters. He had more raw speed than I did. And he ended up going to university, um, being recruited for the same university as me uh, when I went eventually to Jackson State University, I was recruited. Um, um, Dr. Tomari, better known as Clark Godwin to someone at the time, and he was the Bermuda high jump racket holder, got recruited, him and Kenneth Bremer, the late Kenneth Bremer, died in an accident in the uh, Dominican Republic, but he was, uh, I think at that time, Bermuda's uh, racket holder in the triple jump. He certainly ended up um, being the racket holder in the Southwestern Athletic Conference. Um, ironically, I still hold the 1500 meter racket for the Southwestern Athletic Conference. That's interesting. That racket's got to be 40 years old. Um, mm -hmm. I think I ran 345.9. So it wouldn't have been a bad time. It's a pretty decent time for collegiate track and field. But anyway, back to um, me being. Um, or, or discovered as a as an 800 and 1500 meter runner, as much as I was a, a 3000 meter or 5000 meter runner at that time. Um, like I said, I met Carlson. We raced often, and um, after that, I went to um, 
various grifters, but I particularly remember um, going to Bahamas and being pretty dominant in the 800. Uh, I was looking to probably go in the low 150s, if not sub 150, um, because I really started to focus on the 800. But it ended up being a disastrous um, corifter for me because I, I, my foot got stepped on a guy, Clive Edwards from Barbados, who, who later became good friends with me in collegiate competition. He actually stood on me and, and fractured my tibia, the uh, fibula or tibia, one of them, the small burn anyway, not the big burn. And, uh, and my, um, it goes from your, your ankle, I believe, to your foot. And I ended up not being able to perform as well. Um, but my next corifter, I was uh, pretty good because I got two silver medals in Bermuda. And that's the only time Bermuda's actually uh, won corifter overall as a team. And we're probably the only country that's beat Jamaica. It's been so dominant in corifter competition. So, um um, so that was a plus for me. Um, I, st I finally arrived a bit in Carifta, um, I thought. And the very next Carifta, which was held in Barbados, uh, I remember it being very hot in the 90s, man. And, uh, but I was um, well prepared. Um, but again, disaster in the 800. Um, I got tripped up in the 800, went down, got up, um, managed to qualify for the final, but I didn't run as good in the final. Um, but I was probably more prepared in that 800 than any of the other distances that I ran in that Carifta, but I ended up getting two gold medals in the 1500 um, race. I got a gold medal and in the 3000, I got a gold medal in that same Carifta, but I always thought I was better prepared in the eight. So I probably would have been a triple gold medalist in that particular uh, Carifta had it not got tripped up. Um, but, you know, they used to call me the dominator in, in, the, in the Caribbean uh, for some reason. And probably because of my style of running, I, I stayed near the front. And I, I, when I was ready to take off, I really put distance between me and the next person. And then after that, they had to come, come get me if they could. So they, they nicknamed named me the, the, this little yellow boy from Bermuda, the, the dominator. Uh, and uh, in spite of the fact that I was surrounded by very aggressive Caribbean athletes, uh, they thought I was the aggressor, which was very yeah. interesting. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. How, how much did <laughs> you follow you in, in channeling what, what distance you would run um, later on in your career? Well, the funny thing about the university I chose, um, there was a few um, that were looking at me um, more, um, I should say, more prestigious universities. But academically, I, I thought maybe um, I would do better if I went a, a, a historically black university. And so, you know, when Clark Godwin kind of encouraged a number of us to come to Jackson State University, I quickly jumped on that bandwagon, along with a lot of other athletes from Bermuda. Uh, Carlson Phillips was one of them. Um, um, I remember Warren Harvey, uh, Michael Swan was there briefly, Ronaldo Swan was briefly there, um, Vivian Richards who was recruited for 400, ended up being a long distance runner. Uh, Donna Bean, um, better known as Donna Rana, no. Um, uh, uh, Mortimer Sterling, who was always, also a seven foot high jumper at that time. Um, Kenneth Bremer, who I mentioned, Dennis Trott, who actually dominated the sprints in 100 in particular. I remember him running 10 flat, but it was slightly vindicated. So that's the fastest I'm ever seeing of a median athlete go. He done that when he won the NAI 100 on one year. I think it's last year, actually. Um, so we had a good group of athletes that, that went to Jackson State. Um, uh, uh, 
also was um, Gina Smith, who we know as Gina Evans, who married um, Fred Evans. That's where she met Fred at Jackson State University when she is on athletic scholarship. Fred used to hang around the track team and he was good friends with all of us. And eventually they hooked up and the um, rest is history. Of course, they ended up having a son that now holds the Bermuda 800 meter record. Um, but, um, but it was a bunch of us that went Jackson State. Um, I immediately focused on the 800 and 1500 because I realized in this SWAC or the Southwestern Athletic Conference that there wasn't a lot of great distance runners. Um, it's a lot of great sprinters and the middle distance running was pretty strong. Um, but anything longer than 1500 wasn't you know, great competitors down there. So I focused in college, I focused on that, the, the middle distance and ran the 400 really occasionally. Um, uh, was able to run sub 50 for, for um, actually sub 49 for um, relay splits uh, in college. And, um, you know, I ended up being pretty dominant in the 800. Uh, very seldom I ran above 150. I used to run in the 149, 148 area. Very consistent. I never really dipped below 148 much, um, like Aaron did. Aaron ran sub 148 a number of times, but he didn't run um, consistently um, in the 148, 149 area for the whole four years in university like I did. Um, and I, whenever I ran super fast for 800, it was usually in relays. I found that early season relays usually used to drain me where I ran often um, 146 and even better at on one occasion when we won great relays. And I think we broke the collegiate um, bracket, which ended up getting break, broken, you know, in a, and, and, that same year by another university, I think Oklahoma, University of Oklahoma, or one of them broke it. But, um, but I did very good in university. Uh, and of course, my main focus was maintaining my scholarship, but I, I was pretty dominant in the SWAC. Uh, cross country too, I used to pretty much Dominate, but the NAIA, I, 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 I didn't do as well, you know, because all of those colleges, the longer distance guys used to kick in, uh, yeah. from, particularly from the bigger um, white universities. These guys were pretty smooth. And they always seem to have the NAIA cross country events up in the cool. Of course, you know, we were down in the, in the, in the deep south, you know, in Jackson, Mississippi, you know, and, um, we were used to running in the heat. The climate wasn't much different from Bermuda. Actually, it got hotter than Bermuda when the warmer months came. Um, but um, but we never ran cross country. But but nevertheless, I was able to go over to Texas a lot of times. Um, and um, um, you know, um, I won the NAIA championship numerous times. I won the SWAC numerous times. Um, I was even able to qualify for NCAA Division I uh, events, and I still have run one of the fastest times in co collegiate competition for the um, thousand yards. I ran a two of eight um, um, up in Detroit uh, in NCAA um, competition. Um, for some reason, this distances, the indoor distances, we don't keep a lot of rackets of them in Bermuda. Um, so so I, I did pretty good. And probably the highlight of my entire racing career was in, in my junior year in university when I competed in the Liberty Bell Classic. Um, and I was able to place fourth in the finals of that classic, which was for countries that boycotted the 1980 Olympics. I actually was able to beat the two um, Kenyans. 
that were world beaters that year, Peter Lamashon and Amos Carrera, um, Mike Boyd. Um, uh, but the U.S. guys who I competed with um, in NC2A competition were able to beat me on um, Don Page and Randy Wilson. Um, the guy that was third would have been a hard, a tough act to beat because he was ranked number one in the 1500 that year over Sebastian Coe and Steve Ovid that went on to the Olympics. And his he was from Sudan. Um I think his, his first name was Kasif or something like that, or his last name was Kasif. Um, and I remember his name, Radolf, um, by heart, but um, but I knew he was from Sudan. He was, uh, which is right next to Kenya. Um, so we all know the history of the East Africans. And, um, but he was third and I was fourth in that final, which was, was a big accomplishment for me. I was Bermuda's um, top athlete of the year um, at that time, um, uh, based on that performance. And uh, after that, I, I I made it to the 88 Olympics, but I think it was when my career was ending and I wasn't as competitive. Um, but the funny thing is going back to that 80, that 1980 um, event, Probably the biggest mistake, but yes, the best um, thing as far as um, my son is concerned, I always tease him about that. Had I taken the offer to go and run professionally in Europe uh, by um, Adidas at that time, they were offering me to, to finance me to live and compete in Europe. Um, Randy Benjamin, the late Randy Benjamin and Clive Long had negotiated that deal. And I had also got an offer um, to work in Bermuda. And I decided to um, go back home. Um, and pursue, continue pursuing um, the career path I was on. Um, and anyway, um, I never went and took advantage of that opportunity, uh, which I should have for at least a year. Um, but anyway, I was more concerned about finishing college and um, um, getting a viable job. You know, as a black person back then, you thought more about um, being able to uh, secure a career of such once you got back home. Um, unlike today, where, where we fully understand the role of a professional athlete and we take advantage of those opportunities. I didn't, I ended up coming back home and training Doing well, I mean, I, I made it to three or four Pentium Games, 1500 meter finals. I was pretty dominant in, in competition in the CAC area. Um, got a medal or two. Um, I ended up, uh, got, a, got a bronze medal in cross country too, eventually, which was interesting. Um, in team competition. Um, but I ended up coming back home and training from here and um, switched coaches to Jerry Swan, who I thought was um, more knowledgeable um, and helpful in my pursuits um, as a Bermuda-based athlete. But I mean, when I look at the fact that I was Bermuda-based, I ran sub-150 living in Bermuda. I ran sub 346, 345 um, while living in Bermuda and qualified for the 88 Olympics. And um, like I said, did well in numerous Pan Am Games um, competitions and never medaled, but I was made it to the finals, was in the top six, top seven on most occasions. Um, and um, um, you know, enjoy 
the opportunity of being able to get in and out of Bermuda every other weekend uh, or for sponsorship and took advantage of winning the road races and getting the the airline tickets that were offered back there, which they no longer do. They threw it in the pot. I always say because of the prejudices back then with running, that because I was so dominant in track and on the roads, they they eventually decided to um, stop one person from getting the plane ticket all the time. And, <laughs> and, and today, they, uh, shortly thereafter, they started throwing the... Um, you know, that particular um, um, award, you know, to people just to kind of um, uh, raffle it, so to speak, <laughs> the average race. Yeah, so I'm, t- I'm, I'm to blame for that, folks. So. <laughs> well, let me ask you, when did you start turning your attention to the half marathon? I know it wasn't until um, after a few tries that you actually won it, but when did you when did you like focus in and say you know what I'm gonna give this my best shot to try and win it and 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 you did so in in '84. It's funny, you know, because because um, I'm here talking and just like back then I didn't even consider me '24. <laughs> you know, um, my grandfather had had approached me um, on occasion when we used to set off talking on the park benches. Um, and he was out for his walks. I used to run into him on occasion. He used to set off talking, especially if he saw me out running. And he used to tell me about his days of, of being competitive you know, in the Bermuda Regiment. But I think he predated um, May 24th when he was into running. But of course, he got into cricket. And a lot of people knew him more as a, as a bowler for St. George's in, in cup match. Um, but he was the one that encouraged me or um, to run May 24th because that's what he knew. Um, talking to him about Karifta, um wasn't a big deal. Um, um, obviously the Olympics was, but I was pretty young. Uh, oh, I, I had made the Olympics uh, up to that point. And the one I did, they had boycotted. We had boycotted. Um, so, um, but anyway, Eventually, um, I decided, well, let me attempt to run this race. Um, and it was mainly because of him. And um, I didn't do exceptionally well in my first few races. I did manage a second behind Gary Wilkinson. Uh, when the guy from, I think, Switzerland uh, came and, and, and won the race. Um, but of course, um, Carol Wilkinson goes down as the official winner because he wasn't, mm-hmm. he didn't play by the rules uh, we have today, um, which is you have to be a resident here uh, for, for a period of time, yeah, six months. Uh, six rather months. than an international athlete just coming to visit the island. So anyway, he, um, um, so that, I, I, re- I remember first getting involved and that happening. Um, and I didn't win right away. Um, kind of dabbled in and out of it a bit. And then I eventually bogged on and uh, and I think Cal and Leon Matthews had, well, Cal Bean had won the race. I ended up coming second, overhauling Leon Matthews. But the very next year, I um, was beaten by Kevin Pearson. Kevin Pearson had come fresh from college, university, and, and managed to pull the race off. And that prompted me to really put in high mileage, to get serious. Um, when young Kevin beat me, I said, you know something, I've got to devote some time to this particular event. And the very next year, I won the race, but Kevin, Kevin never appeared. <laughs> so we, we laugh about that. Today, because I, I I coach his daughter a bit with horse riding, but um, but we laugh, we laugh, but we joke about that today. The fact that we never really raced each other in May twenty four, and who would have beat each other? Uh, but I I really really, but he was a tough act. But I was really prepared that year 
I wanted, and the time somewhat reflected that, except you still could not give a true reading on our times because that was also the year they switched it to Bernard's Park mm -hmm. from the National Stadium. And um, um, I ran a 109 um, on a course that was probably closer to the proper half marathon distance. The one going up to the stadium was um, um, longer. I think it was just over 14 miles. But the one, the new one to Bernard's Park was, was I think, 13 and a half miles or something like that. It wasn't a proper um, um, half marathon measurement like it is today, which is 13.1. Um, and it's good that they did that because now we have an accurate um, barometer and of the distance rather than um, it chopping and changing so much. Um, but anyway, I, I ran sub 110 that first year. So I guess had I run 14 miles, but you have to consider the fact that the oak was finished going over a hill. So again, it would have slowed you down. So I guess when you, if you, if, if, if you gave me two minutes, I would have still run 111. And I think Kevin's record was 112. But again, you, you know, it, it's not a true reading um, because the climate, the heat varies from year to year, the humidity factor, um, the competitors. Who knows? Kevin may have challenged me better than I challenged him. You never know until you're racing. And then, but, but yeah, I eventually um, ended up quite dominant after that because once I won it once, there was no holding back because I ended up winning it the very next year in 85. Um, so I won 84, 85. And then I got bogged down and focused into track. Pennyum Games became the focus. Uh, and I managed to pull it off the very next year after that. I went back to doing a little bit more mileage. Won it again in 87. I ran it in 86, but I think Tony Ryan had beat me. He was more mileage based. He's a triathlete. And my track and speed work and, and lack of high mileage didn't help. Um, but anyway, I got back involved in 87. And um, again, 88. We all knew that was the Olympic year. And after that, I kind of lost interest in May 24th. And, and I was starting to wind my track career down, so to speak. Um, but um, after being teased, teased numerous years, <laughs> you know, we boys are like this Georges and around the island. <laughs> after being teased and, and accused of being finished, so to speak, um, you know, past those years of, of, of ever being able to win anymore. Um, I remember having a, a, an argument, or conversation, or a friendly argument with a guy who was teasing me up in work, um, not far from Keith Woodless um, stable, because um, I went back into the horses. So I got around the horse guys a lot again. And, um, um, but anyway, um, I remember having um, uh, being teased by this gentleman, and uh, I was told it was. I can't remember the guy. I know him and I see him. I can't remember his name, but I think he owns the um, the um, um, chicken places, roasted chicken, or one of those chicken places. Uh, uh, of course, we laugh about it today, but he. I, I can actually give him credit for prompted me to run the race and win it one last time. And that was in 90, 91. I, I, I was, I remember building, I was building, um, doing a lot of excavating below the house that I lived in. And I was um, along with my godfather, Arnold Daniels. We were, we were pulling a lot of rubble out of there. So that's the only real train. And I got that year, I was running a wheelbarrow from below in a basement, digging it, trying to add more room to my home at that time, uh, or our home at that time. And um, 
Anyway, um, after that argument, <laughs> I think it was the very next day I called um, Tucker. I said, listen, I need a number. You know, back then you could do that. It wasn't as formalized as it is today. And especially being a past miller, it's kind of like I called called him and he says, man, we'd be glad to have you run it again and, and uh, or run it uh, because I I didn't didn't enter early. I, like I said, I had the last minute and he gave me a number and I think the race was the very next day, if I'm not mistaken. And I ran the race and that's when Terrence Armstrong and his classmates um, or his fellow runner um, in university um, ran that year. And um, anyway, that was a funny story in itself because when the race started, I didn't expect to be in, but I, but I, 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 like I said, I had I had a lot of disposition in me that year in terms of trying to win. And anyway, after that that conversation and, and friendly argument uh, with the gentleman, I said, "Listen, boy, um, any chance I got, these guys are taking off pretty quick. I'm got to go with them, and they will probably hurt me more than them." Uh, but but anyway, I went and. They were having him and his friend was having a um, conversation while they was running, and I said, "Man, these guys must be pretty good shape. They're talking a lot." And but then I started to listen to what they were saying. Of course, that that put more disposition in me because they was talking about they was they was trying really to psych me up because I had gone with them, and they was talking. Well, what do you think we should pick it up more? Or? Uh, or wait a little longer and see how we feel. Uh, uh, should we put more distance in them? You know, giving me the impression that they still weren't running hard. You know what I mean? And I knew we was playing because we went through that first mile in sub five. And, and that second mile, we was going even faster. So I was like, okay, well, I'll put your weight heel. And these guys are trash talking. And obviously, they friends. Or they knew each other, and I'm kind of the one that that that, that they're trying to psych out. So I said, "Well, I'm going to play this game too, because you know we did that, you know, in May 24th. You know, I remember me and Cal and told Ted Wall Raven was supposed to be the favorite. We psyched him out similarly, you know. Um, I remember me telling Cal, well, "Listen, by this guy's pace is not fast enough for us." You take the inside, I take the outside. Let's go over this hill, boy. And we actually did it. And the guy, last year, had the guy dropped out of the race. The, the Canadian guy, Ted Waldridge Raven, was his name. And that was, you know, we went on. Um, I think that would, may have been the year I won it. But anyway, um, this last time with these guys, like I said, I was used to trash talkers. I said, well, I'm going to get in on this. So I said, listen, you guys, I think we do need to step it up because, you know, we, we guys, I knew these guys had never run me 24, see, fresh out of college. I said, because we guys normally run a much quicker pace than this, you know. <laughs> you know? Of course, Terrence is probably thinking, now, what is Watson talking about? You know, or, or, okay, he's getting in on this. So the funny thing was, a half a mile later, nobody made a move. So that's, so that's when I knew, okay, I'm getting in these guys here. So I said, yeah, uh, if I'm going to have a chance to win this thing, I'm going to go now. And I'm not feeling too bad. So I went, you know, probably two and a half miles into the race. I went like crazy. And... I said, let me put a lot of distance between these guys and me. By the time I get to Harbor Red, I can try to recover. But hopefully they're discouraged enough. So anyway, I was going like crazy. Got on down to Red Hill. Was feeling pretty good, except that my, my, my tank was starting to run on E. You know what I mean? Because remember, I hadn't I had really put in the work that year, right? So um, I was counting on muscle memory and my determination and, and of course, um, disposition from from from. I kept thinking about 
though. Yeah, the conversation <laughs> we had in the race and the conversation the night before, I said, nah, I, I can't feel oh, nah, I got to hurl yeah. on. And anyway, along comes Hess. That's what, was, what his name was, Hess. His last name was Hess. Along comes Hess. I said, well, Terrence in here with this guy I showed up. And I said, oh, man, what are you going to do now? Anything chance I'm going, let me go again. Because Hess came and started talking again. That was his biggest mistake. Then he started talking again. Disposition came again. I went. Didn't, didn't say nothing this time, just went. And anyway, probably, probably hitting, hitting front street now. I'm glimpsing back. I'm saying, this guy, okay, I'm, I'm pulled away from this guy. But anyway, later I was told that he dropped out because he was an unofficial entry. You know, so I don't know whether he would <laughs> run me or, or what. But all was I know was I was back in front and I had about a mile to hang on to, say a mile and a half or whatever to hang on. I was on E. I'm going to tell you, if Terrence would have pulled up on me, in Front Street, I probably would have either flopped out or conceded because I was definitely on E. From there on in, that last mile, I was struggling to get to the finish line. But I, I pulled it off and ended up getting straight to the hospital and, <laughs> get, get, get on the IV, which I didn't care. I had won the race, right? Uh, um, and um, But anyway... That, that was my May 24th history. You know? that, that's my May 24th story, so to speak. You know? uh, and I really was an athlete focused on longer distances, but I was able to pull it off four times, which, you know, I, I, now I look back and I, I'm pretty proud of that. You know? Well, I do, yeah. I do want to come back with you and obviously talk about your time at, at, with the horses, because that, that's another um, episode of which you, you have spent a lot of time. Uh, you're into the Western, which is not not well known in Bermuda, but it's it's it, when they when people see it at the exhibition, they're really impressed with the way how uh, you guys get the horses to do the commands around the around the uh, cans and and so forth. And, and that that I really want to um, home in on because I think it's important. The, the lessons learned from your experiences. And I think if people want to get into a, something different, it offers that. Right, right, no problem. I ain't going to say much on that until we have that interview, but um, you can take a look at their blue ribbons behind me. <laughs> well, that, that's the colors of, that's the colors of champions. Like uh, there you go. the colors of champions. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, to and that too, and that too, yeah, 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 yeah. that, that too, that's remember, right. that, that right. too, that too, you see the colors, the face mask is ready, there you go, the there you go, you know what I mean? and my wife made me a nice blue and blue one too, that's better looking than this, you know, I, I, I don't get near her red and blue one, you know how that goes, yes, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's a lot of fun in this house around cop match, you know. Um, a lot of people from St. George's teach me, are you marry a woman from Somerset? I said, man, that's the best thing I could have done. We have a lot of fun. And the captain's mother at that. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Somerset captain's mother at that. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, it's all good. Yeah, yeah it's all good. Hey, you never know where love takes you, you know what I mean? That's true. That's true. Yeah. yeah. All right, Mike, yeah. I want to thank you again, and uh, we'll be talking with you sometime soon again. Next time, next edition will be about uh, life with, with horses. Hey, there you go. Yeah, I'll be anxious to tell that story. Yes, sir. All right. Have a good I'll day. You, you too. Okay. All right.